Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. We are very fortunate in this particular episode of Long Beach Lens because thanks to the book, Positive Possibilities, written by Dr. Matthew Jenkins, who you're about to meet, and to the support of Dr. Alex Norman uh, and his uh, graciousness, we were able to be here to share not only what the book is about, but how you might be able to get something out of it that might make a difference in your life if you pay attention. So first, let me thank all of you for being on the set with me. Dr. Jenkins, thank you for writing the book. Mrs. Jenkins, for your contribution. But Dr. Norman, I want to start with you because I was reading the press telegram and you were quoted in the press telegram about your thoughts on the book. And I would like for you to share that with those who are viewing. Why was it so important? Well, first of all, I couldn't believe the book. So I had to read it a second time. And uh, the thing that really impressed me was not only the, the values that Dr. Jenkins talked about, but his single focus, you know, his ability to plan. My, my dad used to always say, plan your work and work your plan. Mm -hmm. Well, people have said that I was very disciplined, but compared to Matthew, <laughs> you know, I was free floating. <laughs> I mean, because uh, one of the things that impressed me most was his um, 7-7, seven, seven, I believe he called it, where he worked seven days a week for seven straight years just so he could retire at 45. Mm -hmm. And I, I read that, and I had to go back and read it again, you know. And, he, <laughs> and I thought, seven years for seven days a week, that's discipline. Mm -hmm. That's focus. Mm -hmm. That's power. And I thought, you know, People need to, they need to read this because this is a success story. Right. Because I'm sure all during that time he had to hit a lot of bumps in the road. But those bumps in the road didn't stop him, you know. I always say, it's not so important how you fall down. It's how important when you get up. So that's the important thing. And he seemed to persist. And I think persistence yeah. kind of makes you almost omnipotent in some ways. Right. Now... Dr. Jenkins, for those who are watching, they're like, well, wow, this is Superman in a suit here uh, in terms of all that you've accomplished. But if I could recap real quickly, uh, grew up on a farm, driving a tractor by five years old or seven years old, working hard on your family farm. Your family not only had a small farm that started with your father, but you also went on to become entrepreneurs, your own power company. You oh, were my, bus driving kids to school? So we ended up with a big farm. 1,000 acres? 1,000 acres. And when you plant two and sometimes three crops on there, you're talking about 2,000, 3,000 acres. Wow. Because a lot of time you plant early and you get a crop and then you put another crop in and some of them you can get a third crop. And that work ethic started early on oh, in your yeah. life. Oh, yeah, at 5 o'clock, we milked the cows. James, my uh, adopted brother, and I, we milked the cows at 5 o'clock. And you say that to this day, you still wake up early. But you mentioned your brother. Your, two of your brothers, I believe, were Tuskegee Airmen? Yeah. So not only did you attend Tuskegee, but the precedent had already been set before you got there. Oh, yeah. With, with your siblings and your mom. Oh, yeah. Studied with Dr. Carver. Oh, yeah. So that was profound as well. I want to talk about the fact that you were in the School of Veterinary Science. You went to the military, and then they put you in the furthest place they could put you away yep. as a minority because that yep. was a trend. And when you got there, you made a profound uh, finding when it came to rabies. Can you share that story? Yes. Um, uh, I got there, and I noticed... Animals were dying, and the veterinarians before me, um, they were sending them to the lab in the United States. It's in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts. And for, for some reason, I didn't believe the lab results. So I called the 
the Secretary of Defense and told him about it and um, asked if I could send my specimen to London, the World Health Center in London. Mm -hmm. So I got authorization for that. And as soon as I sent them there, the first report came back positive. And that's when um, um, it was a big deal. Um, then we had to, we set up a disease control program for the whole country. I had helicopters that carried me all over the country, setting up this um, control uh, protocol. And this is in Greenland? In Greenland, yeah. So it took you. And then was they tried to take my work from me, the generals and stuff like that, and I had to figure out a way to get around them. And that was a positive possibility. So you, yes. they think they're putting you in exile by putting you in Greenland. That's right. Only for you to go to Greenland and to discover rabies. And then they try to take and it. And then try to take the, take yeah. the credit for it. <laughs> so when you talk positive possibility. But I was cool all the time. All the time. All the time, yeah. So I, we, I'll figure, give me time and I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. That's been your motto throughout oh, yeah. life, too. Give me the time, I'll figure it out. Right. So when you were at Tuskegee, if we back up a moment, you met this lovely, you, you're looking at someone descending some stairs, and it happened to be this young lady sitting next to you here, uh, Miss Roberta Jenkins. Yeah. Uh, may I shift to you, Ms. Jenkins, and say, when, uh, as Dr. Jenkins was going through his Greenland experience and then coming back uh, to the States and setting up his practice in veterinary medicine, uh, how were you being supportive in that regard? Because you had your own career as well, and together you've built what has become now a legacy. Well, I started off as when he was in, we had just gotten married, so he went into the military, and they sent him to Greenland, so actually I could not go there. Right. So I went, I was at a graduate school in Boston while he was in Greenland, and then uh, when he came back and we came to California, um, and he always wanted to move. To, he always wanted to move to California. We're going to California, so I had to make a decision about uh, we weren't going to stay in the South. We knew that, <laughs> and uh, he, so we got in our little car and we drove to California. But he had to take the board, so he got a job as a poultry inspector with the government, and uh, he started with that. And I worked at the hospital, uh, and we saved all my salary, which wasn't very much, but it was a Right. It was whatever it was, and we saved every penny of it, and we lived off of what he was, the little money he was making. And then he passed the board and went into practice, and as he practiced, um, the practice grew, and I started helping out with um, paying the bills in the beginning, and then as we uh, grew, so I kind of became the CFO, I guess. All right. And then I, All then right. I, then as we, when he sold his practice. We went into, um, with the mobile home parks, we were, um, I, be, I ran the office and mm -hmm. spent a great deal of my time with uh, training people and also hiring and firing most of our employees. And you, I think you mentioned to me that at the time that you went into the real estate industry and specifically mobile home parks, there weren't any other African Americans uh, buying mobile home parks the no. way you were. No, there was not. Right. No. And there still are probably very few, if right. there are any. I, don't, I really don't know at this point. Right. And you, uh, so that, again, our viewers understand who haven't wrote, read the book, and you should read the book. So from veterinary science, you follow, you create your plan because you say you got to have a plan. And not only just in uh, being a veterinarian, but you were also involved in creating insurance uh, with partners uh, for uh, people who have pets, which is a big deal today. Uh, yeah. that, was, that was major. And then you go into uh, mobile home parks and uh, doing things there. And uh, I want to ask you, Dr. Norman, as you think of all the things, because you read the book twice, as you said, and all the accomplishments that this couple has, has had in life. Uh, one quote was talking about uh, power is not voluntarily given. And clearly, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins have seize the day in whatever moment that they found those opportunities. What does that say to you when you hear that quote for our leadership today as well? Well, it, it really 
I guess it harkens back to something, a quote from Frederick Douglass, that power never concedes anything. It never has and it never will. And what it means is that you really have to carpe season. You have to seize the day. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to seize the opportunity, create the positive possibility out of whatever situation you're in. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 I guess it's a, it's a reminder that a bump in the road is only a bump in the road. You know, it's not something that you give up on. And, uh, and I like the, I like the straightforwardness of, in, in, in Dr. Jenkins's world, there are two options. You succeed or you give up. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what happens when you're dealing in a situation where you have the personal power to persist in the face of all odds being against you. So then for the bump in the road, you either go around it, over it, under it, through it. You find some way, as he says, give me enough time and I'll figure a way out of it. Mm -hmm. That's a positive attitude. And that's a powerful thing. That adds to your personal power. So if you believe it and you can conceive it, it'll happen. And I know, Dr. Jenkins, that you mentioned that grace requires me to believe that I am no better than anyone else and no one else is better than me. And that had to be something also, a belief that, that drove you to be successful as well, would you agree? Oh, yeah. You always feel that you can do whatever you want to do. Right. And you have to feel that in here. Right. And that's, that's how you think. That's how, that's your, that's how you think. When you think like that, we went to Vegas, and uh, all these guys supposed to be with me to to, uh, to enact uh, anti-discrimination laws, and there were about 12 or 13 of them. They didn't show up. Didn't bother me a bit. <laughs> when I got through making my presentation and everything, I got a standing ovation. Got them all passed by myself. Didn't bother me. And I've never said a word to him about it either. Just did what you knew you had to do in that moment. You do what you have to do. What we have to do right now is take a quick break. But we're going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and join us when we return with more of Dr. Matthew Jenkins, Mrs. Roberta Jenkins, and Dr. Alex Norman here on Long Beach Atlanta. Welcome back to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, and if you're just joining us, we are having a great conversation with the author of Positive Possibilities, Dr. Matthew Jenkins, Long Beach's own Dr. 
Matthew Jenkins and his wife, Mrs. Roberta Jenkins, and Dr. Alex Norman. So, Dr. Norman, I want to start with you because much of the book speaks to having a plan, having a self-discipline, uh, but it also, I think, in my opinion, reflects on leadership as well. Mm -hmm. Why, from your perspective, being involved in the community as you've been over the years, do you think this book is so important from an African-American leadership perspective? Well, one of the things that this did for me was to give me much more of an incentive to write on African-American leadership. My dissertation, I looked at the dominant themes and leadership positions in the African-American community and the history of African-Americans. And the three that popped up were Booker T. Washington, who created the institution of Tuskegee, as well as a num numerous other uh, uh, schools throughout the South. Um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who created the uh, NAACP, uh, and, um, and Marcus Garvey, who uh, had the Back to Africa movement and created a steamship, a uh, star steamship. I mean, it had a business with 27,000 followers. Mm. But they never could get together. They fought each other. Mm. Each one of those um, approaches were valid because the problems that African Americans face are multidimensional. Mm -hmm. So it takes a multidimensional approach. I was really, uh, really happy to hear uh, Dr. Jenkins talk about uh, going to Vegas to, um, to get some civil rights uh, legislation or, or, or policy uh, implemented. Mm -hmm. Now, that was uh, W.V. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. you know? That is uh, Booker T. Washington. And uh, he, the nationalism that he, he finds, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, you know, you gotta work hard, you gotta be available for the opportunity when it opens, you know, that's straight out of Marcus Garvey, you know, to, to be that entrepreneur, to take advantage when the, when the time comes. All embodied in, in this. All embodied one, in one man. man. Right. And, uh, and so what I see in him are those three components working in harmony mm -hmm. and to me my desire is that we could implement that as individuals mm -hmm. working in harmony even though we may have different goals mm -hmm. there's a, a singular goal mm -hmm. that we can come together on whether it's poverty or whether it's ethnicity or whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, that there is something that unifies us Right. And, and, and that's the most important thing that I think comes out of this book for me. Now, Mrs. Jenkins, I have three granddaughters and I have a daughter. Uh, from a, a female perspective uh, in this world that we live in today, what would you say to the young ladies, uh, both those who are adults and those that are the age of my young granddaughters, when you think about positive possibilities, what words of encouragement would you offer them knowing what you've been through in your lifetime? Well, I'd really, I'd, first of all, I'd tell them to know that they're beautiful because I think that's one of the things that we don't tell our children mm -hmm. and that they, they can do anything they want to. All they have to do is work hard, put forth efforts. Uh, there are always people there who are willing to help and that there's, there's, there's a way to work and work smart and it doesn't have to be the hardest thing you've ever done. It can be the easiest. And if you need help, ask for it. Mm -hmm. I think that's always one thing that, because there are always people who are willing to help you. You know, I think in the South, we grew up more like in a, in a people cared about each other and our, our teachers uh, cared about us right. as students. Right. And uh, there was the community care, the lady down the street yeah. or around the corner. You know, there was always somebody who was, who is watching, watching your back. Out, right. That's right. So you just, uh, you learn from that. But, you know, you also learn from, as you grow, and I, I was exposed to those things as a child, but when, I, when we were in business and when we started this business with the mobile home parks, 
I didn't know anything about it, and neither did Matt. We were just we were newer, but people. Need, but I and I knew when, when we purchased something, uh, he would have to um, purchase it sight unseen. But he wrote certain orders asking for that if I get there and don't like it, then you get it back. Mm -hmm. You have to. I, I can refuse it, but. Uh, but I learned that I didn't, when I went into a new city and I was go to something like uh, one of the hardware stores to ask for credit because my, my uh, managers need to be able to purchase different things without my being there. And since I was in California, they were probably in, in right. uh, Alabama somewhere right. or Indiana. Uh, I would just give them my card and tell them who I am and that we just purchased this mobile home park and what I would like to be able to set up credit. I didn't ask them if they would give it to me. Right. So I, I approached them from the standpoint that it was very hard for them to say no. Right. I did have somebody in Selma, Alabama who did refuse me, hmm. but only one. Hmm. And but he the said, key is to assert yourself. Right. You yeah. have to, so it was just, uh, and I just thought about that when I, knowing yeah. the situations and knowing the things, because if I go and ask, <coughs> then they could easily say, well, no, we don't do that, or we don't do this. But this way I make it, when the way I ask for it makes it hard. So you just have to learn, mm -hmm. learn the different uh, nuances of people and you try new things and you find ways of getting it done. And that's, right. I think that's what you talk about, use your personal power too. Right. Yeah, because uh, you're moving. Yeah. And as a woman, it was always, it's, you're gonna be looked down, you know, as we say today, men, men, women don't make as much money as men doing the same jobs, mm -hmm. and we're still facing those kind of things, and there's discrimination in the, in the, uh, in the office of uh, <laughs> CFOs and CEOs and those kind of mm -hmm. things, but with our big 500 companies. But there's, there's always a place for you, and the, if you wanna do something, you can do it. We're convinced yeah. of that. Dr. Jenkins, in the book, you mentioned the story of John McGuire. Uh, the setting you gave was that when Martin Luther King uh, passed, uh, everyone was at the home, and uh, Mr. McGuire got there late in the evening, and maybe 11 o'clock or so, and when he got there, he asked, how could he help? And uh, they gave him a broom and asked him if he could help by sweeping the floor. And there was a point in the evening as he was sweeping, uh, that Coretta Scott King started to have conversations with him because they were friends. But I bring that up because that's servant leadership. It didn't matter who he was as a college president or whatever the role. If it required sweeping the floor for a friend, he swept the floor for a friend. Mm -hmm. When you think about leadership today, uh, the question is about servant leadership. Uh, what would you say to people who are in leadership roles uh, about a story like this and what we should do. Do whatever is necessary to accomplish the objective. Mm -hmm. John McGuire is one of the most caring individuals. He, he, was, he and Martin Luther King were roommates mm -hmm. at Boston University. And um, he's a personal friend of ours. Mm -hmm. Been so for years and the guy is incredible. When I f first Got on. He took me on the board. At, got me on the board at Claremont. And um, when um, I got there, these people in, <laughs> this is the first time they had a minority on the board. And and I uh, oh I just spoke out loud. <laughs> I changed the whole culture out there. I'm sure you did. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Next thing I know, they asked me to be chairman of the board. <laughs> In fact, they called me about two weeks ago and said, we still want you to be chairman of the board. I said, no, I, I have no interest in that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. When, we were, when I first met you uh, about this interview a couple of weeks ago, and even today, you, you just keep saying you just can't believe the impact this book is having on people. I still can't believe it because... You know, when I was writing the book, I was just writing my thoughts. I, I didn't think about yeah. all this stuff. No way. But um, I get calls from all over the country about this book. It's, it's, um, I never had an idea, it would, any idea, it would be so impactful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I know, Mrs. Jenkins, that you're very involved in, in getting the word out. And it's not about, to me, promoting the book. It's about the principles and the values that you both are sharing in this because uh, a big theme about this is caring and about not just looking at yourself but looking outward as to what your legacy would be. Uh, what do you hope to see uh, as the way the book touches lives as people read this book? I think it's a game changer. It, it would uh, definitely, anyone who reads it will find something in that book that will help them in their life. No matter how old or young no they are. No matter how old or young they are. Mm -hmm. And the younger you are, the more time that you have to work toward it, of course. But mm -hmm. no matter, even if somebody, somebody someone who's retired, mm -hmm. uh, there's something there will even spark you to say, you know, I've been doing this all these years and I did this. Why don't I volunteer? Mm -hmm. Because I think we, we start our foundation for the simple reason that uh, we, we were giving all the time, and it, and it provided a tool for us to be able to give in a certain manner and to, and to control it. So, mm -hmm. and I think it, um, and we've never had less forgiving. That has always been our blessing. Never had less forgiving. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a profound statement. Yeah. And Dr. Norman, you, you know, I call you a mentor. Uh, you've been someone who's been uh, in the, not just talking the game, but walking the game in the streets of uh, Long Beach and many other communities. and. And so I know when you say this is a must-read, it's a must-read. But you know I work with youth a lot. And uh, for a young man or a young woman out there, what would you say to them about positive possibilities in life? You know, to never give up. You know, that one, that um, the song, you got to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, how are you going to make a dream come through? Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, each young person out there has a dream about what it is that they want to do in life. Mm -hmm. And um, this book says, follow that dream. But in order to follow that dream, make a plan. You know, Plan the way you're going to get to that dream. And that if you run into obstacles, that obstacle is a challenge. It's not impenetrable that you can get through it, but that you have to use that personal power, you know. And that personal power is really based on the belief in self. Mm -hmm. And I would say to the young people, believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it, and it will get done. I couldn't think of a, a better way to end this conversation. As I always say, we're, we're out of time, but not out of questions. Thank you all. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. and. Uh, positive possibilities. Uh, never give up on your dreams. Always see that there are positive possibilities in the problems that you may face. Thank you for watching Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, and it's been my honor to share this story with you.